Good morning. To open up, first we're going to look at the vaccine reactions reported to the VAERS system via the CDC. If we look at the current VAERS report, if you look at the database as follows, we are now at 230.4 megabytes comparatively in 2020. We're at 41.25 megabytes. So you can tell the size or the reactions being reported are coming in very, very rapidly. I like to honestly know if the CDC actually has the um, staffing in order to investigate all those reports, because those reports so far are as follows. In 2020, we only had 57,115 vaccine adverse reaction reports versus 2021, which we are now at June 20, 2021 at 1236 AM. And before I forget, Good morning to all of our data scientists, analysts, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, and all of our wonderfully informative, how I should say, but very important small audience. Gratitude and good morning. It is 2021. We have 346,964 vaccine adverse event reports. When I ran the data, there is about a 20 day, day lag between the vaccine and the reports being filed. So this is obviously going to grow uh, for quite some time. And this is only pretty much the immediate reactions long term. Uh, we will see that's for the future. But to proceed as follows, the information that we're going to review first in whole is as follows. Common cold combats COVID-19, incredible research. Scientists prepare for the next coronavirus pandemic, most likely in 2028. I'll give you the hypothesis as to why. Symptoms are resolved in seven patients with myocarditis-like illness after COVID-19 vaccination. We went through the various database as a whole, and the number is a little larger than seven people that have come down with myocarditis. But again, vaccine-averse event reports need to be validated. That's why I'm concerned whether the CDC actually has enough staffing to basically review those reports in an expedited method or format, especially since we're dealing with a new vaccination under emergency approval uh, that did not have the traditional uh, length of time between phase one, phase two, and phase three. All right, COVID-19 infection rates are look Get that away. Less than 1% for those with severe illness, which is good news. And then, of course, we're going to look at the FDA, uh, how they maintain their emergency use authorization for vaccines to prevent COVID-19. You'll be quite intrigued as to a little bit of a footnote into how they can maintain emergency use authorization, even past the point there may be adequate uh, other treatments that could be is just as effective, if not more. But to proceed as follows, let's go right into the data. And the first one, common cold combats COVID-19. In a new study, the research found that the common respiratory virus jump starts the activity of interferon stimulated genes, early response molecules in the immune system, which could halt replication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus within airways, tissues, airways, tissues, please forgive me. Airway tissues infected with the cold. And also keep in mind too, fact checkers, we're not going to be adding much publisher bias to this, but we are going to go off on a tangent. But still, if you're a fact checker, check our facts, as always. But gratitude, just the same. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job by protecting our channel and keeping it going, even though other much more popular individuals have not had such a fortunate um, outcome. To proceed. So this is what they looked at. Since earlier studies by Foxman's lab showed that the common cold virus may protect against influenza, they decided to study whether the rhinovirus would have the same beneficial impact against the COVID-19 virus. For the study, her team infected lab-grown human airway tissue with SARS-CoV-2 and found that for the first three days, viral load in the tissue doubled about every six hours. Now remember too, it's strongly important in reference to the timing of the cold virus. But to conclude, however, replication of the COVID-19 virus was completely, 
I'm just quoting the research, completely stopped in tissue which had ex been exposed to rhinovirus. All right. So to reiterate, however, replication of the COVID-19 virus was completely stopped in tissue which had been exposed to rhinovirus. Again, I'll have the links to the study from Yale University, and they have a little bit of a dire warning towards the bottom. Again, this is for you to interpret, not I. There are concerns that as social distancing measures ease, common cold and flu viruses, which have been dormant over the past year, will come back in greater force. Interference among respiratory viruses could be a mitigating factor creating an upper limit on the degree to which respiratory viruses co-circulate. Quote, there are hidden interactions between viruses that we don't quite understand. And these findings are a piece of the puzzle we are just now looking at. A very, very humble way and a very, very acutely scientific way of how a researcher actually looks at things. They don't claim to have all the answers, but however though, they keep an open mind to all potential outcomes. And in this case, they are all they are saying is we really don't know. And we're learning as we go along. So again, speaking in absolutes can really, really skew things. And very, very few true researchers that I'm aware of actually ever use absolutes. So again, read those words carefully and basically infer your own uh, meaning in reference to that. Now let's go to the next one. Scientists prepare for the next coronavirus pandemic. Now what they looked at is this. Now I traditionally thought it always happened to um, coincide with solar flare activity because a while ago we we're taught like about every 11 years because of uh, solar flare activity uh, upper atmospheric radiation causes greater mutation, so on and so forth. But however, though, they're saying this, and they are, they are really, I mean, we were all a little traumatized by, um, I think, a lot of the measures that took place during the pandemic, whether you were concerned about the disease or the draconian um, lockdown measures, as well as the fact is it, you know, it created a lot of societal friction between people which normally liked each other. But during the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of like. But here it goes. Scientists preparing for a possible next coronavirus pandemic to strike, keeping with the seven year pattern since 2004. And it's kind of interesting. Future drug could also be used to treat common cold. Now, again, they're looking at new medications that are referenced to coronaviruses, which is the common cold, is part of that family. Uh, but you don't have to worry about this per se. They're recommending the medication be used um, early on. But the procedure, you'll see what I mean in a second. The Northwestern team previously mapped the structure of a virus protein called NSP16, which is present, present, present in all coronaviruses. The new study provides critical information that could aid drug development against future coronaviruses as well as SARS-CoV-2. They discovered a coronavirus-specific pocket in the protein. See how the, everyone's learning, and uh, which is real important. And you can understand why this kind of throws a wrench into FDA's emergency use authorization aspect, because a lot of these can be really good treatments. And this is also unique too. The NSP16 that binds to the virus genomic fragment held in place by metal ion. Now, there was a study that came out a few days ago referenced these metal ions where how the coronavirus tends to evade capture due to these metal ions, which to me is just, is just bizarre. The fragment is used by the coronavirus as the template for all the viral building blocks. So while some of the coronavirus proteins vary a lot, the NSP16 See, as opposed to what they're utilizing right now in the spike protein, is nearly the same across most of them. The unique pocket discovered by Satchel's group is present in all the different coronavirus members. This means that drugs designed to fit this pocket should work against all coronaviruses, including a virus that emerges in the future, and should work against the common cold that is caused by a coronavirus. Again, risk to benefit ratio. Um, 
you know, if you got the coronavirus and the medication works really, really well, or you can wait for a common cold, as we discussed earlier. But see, that's intriguing. The NSP-16, it's something new. And if they modify uh, research in reference to this NSP-16, that is uh, basically commonality across all coronaviruses, that could be a tremendous game changer as well, as opposed to also as well as all the other game changers that you and I have reviewed over the past 36 weeks, uh, which uh, had tremendous promise, but for whatever reason fell flat. And uh, let's proceed as follows. Next one. Symptoms resolved in seven patients with myocarditis, myocarditis like illness after COVID-19 vaccination. All right. Now, this is interesting. Six of the men received mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, five of the vaccines were manufactured by Pfizer, one by Moderna, and one patient received the adenovirus Johnson & Johnson. So again, six mRNA, one of the adenovirus Johnson & Johnson. And this is what they mentioned in the study, but you won't find in the actual news release as follows. But to proceed, let's make this a little bigger. You read that okay? Our series of several male COVID-19 vaccination recipients who presented with myocarditis-like myocarditis -like illness supports a potential causal association with vaccina vaccination given the temporal relationship. Now keep in mind, the researcher here stressed, and again, this is their hypothesis and maybe their observation and their feelings. It doesn't necessarily represent everyone's, but theirs were as follows, that basically that the vaccine is disaffective and the benefits far exceed the far outseed, far exceed the very unusual risks. So uh, what I want to do is add a respect for the researcher and not to skew uh, their implication and what they're implying and basically to continue to have research like this be done. Uh, I don't want to add publisher bias and I want to quote what the researcher says. So in addition to the benefits of our vaccination, whether I agree with it or not, see what I mean? Uh, the, benef the benefits of the vaccination far exceed the very unusual risk. I want to be respectful, not light. Because saying something like this in this day is really a dangerous thing uh, for that association. But the researcher also stressed very much so that uh, basically towards the end of the actual research, research that vaccine adverse event reporting remains of high importance so they can see if there's actually a correlation, if not a causative relationship between myocarditis, I can't pronounce it properly tonight, uh, and basically the observations in this research. Now, let's keep in mind, this was seven. We are going to go to the research real fast, and I am going to show you right here what we did. All right, what I did here is we went through the database, the CDC database, and looked at all of AIR's reports, not looked at them, but we uh, basically um, extracted information from the database. And so I just put myocarditis without the S, just in case of misspellings, because a lot of times these reports are pretty sloppy, but just the same. These are the ones, not that many compared to overall in the vaccinate, uh, you know, the number of vaccines administered, you know, and uh, an event report doesn't mean, it just means it needs to be investigated, all right? So I don't want to add more dimensions to it than there actually is. Uh, so if you see down here, myocarditis, and you see basically these individuals, for example, uh, cardiac arrest, so on and so forth, they basically died according to the adverse event reaction report, potentially due to the vaccine. And you can go down here and you can pull up these reports as you'd like. Um, and you could see the symptom versions, the symptoms that they had and what they did, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the total number of individuals that may have suffered for, or may have suffered from myocarditis in response to a vaccine reaction, at least reports-wise, 
are all the way down this line. In fact, if you look down here, if you could read what you're reading, as I'm just going to the symptoms, there are actually 501 reports of myocarditis that need to be investigated. So when we look at this data here, and you see seven, that could be a little misleading. So at least according to the database, in reference to VAERS, I'm being very, very detailed here, there are at least 501 reports. None of those 501 reports, it appears that there may have been requiring investigation, one, two, three, at least four fatalities so far. Uh, and that's if all the uh, adverse events are actually being reported. That's the other caveat too. So let us proceed forward to the next aspect as we follow through. All right, reinfection rates. COVID-19 reinfection rates less than 1% with those with severe illness, which is actually pretty darn good because before you keep on going, you know, you don't develop an immunity, so on and so forth. This is like report, again, we've been doing this for 36 weeks. This is like maybe report number nine or 10 uh, in reference to uh, reinfection rates being far, far lower. So what they did, a review of more than 9,000 US patients with severe COVID-19 infection showed less than a 1% contracted, showed less than 1% contracted the illness again with an average reinfection time of three and a half months. That's actually pretty darn fast. Our analysis also found that asthma and nicotine dependence were associated with reinfection. So that's something to consider uh, per se, but however though, less than 1% out of 9,000 uh, reinfection, that's pretty positive. So being infected uh, with COVID-19 infection uh, does seem to be a little bit more powerful at this point in time uh, unless there has to be a correlate, there has to be a sexual study done, but from an observation standpoint, from my perspective, um, seems to, to outdo the effectiveness of most of the vaccines. Uh, now the question is too, when they were doing the vaccine research, they, I don't know if they've actually completed the research in those being vaccinated that had already had uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 exposure. That's part of what's required too, in order to get an adequate authorization in reference to uh, vaccination approval outside of emergency use uh, authorization, because you don't know how a person that already may have had the ailment is gonna to respond to a vaccine designed to prevent the ailment. So again, does it may, do, may be perfectly fine? It may not. The question is again, at this point in time, we don't know. And so that to me is always a big, big uh, caveat. Next, here we go. This is how they basically maintain their strength in reference to the emergency use authorization. Now, a lot of individuals were wondering, there's a correlation, not, not a conspiracy. How every treatment, whether it be nutritional, medication, otherwise, was so quashed and attacked so heavily. Many may recognize that basically there was a major news organization which has a conservative leaning and uh, was caught and the uh, one of the reporters released the tape, uh, not the tape, what was it, 19, no, that's like Biden, they released the tape or the recording, I should say, of the Fox News editors, oh, sorry about that, uh, you know, talking to this individual saying, you know, how they don't want to continue reporting on whatever they're reporting per se in reference to uh, potentially other treatments and so on and so forth. There's one caveat here and how the uh, FDA received its emergency use authorization. Oh, not the one to go that one. We want to go this way. Here we go. All right. So looking at that criteria and considerations for the issuance of an E an EUA for a COVID-19 vaccine. One of, the, one of the parameters which were required to be met in order to get the EUA was as follows. Now, keep this little footnote here in mind for the justification. There is no adequate approved 
and available alternative to the product for diagnosing, preventing, or treating the disease or condition. So the word adequate uh, is really, really open up to uh, interpretation. What is adequate? Uh, and also alternative. So let's say, for example, at that time was President Trump, let's say his hydroxychloroquine was truly an effective treatment or basically ivermectin was truly an effective treatment or vitamin D or zinc or whatever, uh, at least in part of resistance and uh, reduction in transmission. I think there was hesperidin, there was, there was so many things, but they all, once the outcome seemed to be positive, it never seemed to go very far beyond that. But there is, that's one thing you have to keep in the back of your mind. If there was an adequate treatment that was available, would this emergency use authorization still be enforced? Now, here's the footnote. You ready for this? Here it goes. Ready? Da, 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 da. Number three. Right there. Let's make this a little larger. There is that. An emergency use authorization may remain in effect beyond the duration of the public health emergency declaration if all the statutory conditions are met. So, as long as there's not this, there is this. You get my drift? So again, my my objective is here in policy making and, bu and bureaucratic uh, decision making is is there a conflict of interest or a bias that may be inhibiting adequate research that can help a lot of individuals? I mean, seriously, that can help a lot of individuals. All right, but to proceed, that's all that matters to me. And if that actually makes a huge difference without actually all trying to alter a person, you know, in some way biologically, uh, why not? It's all about risk to benefit ratio. Why would you why would you prefer to have an experimental treatment as opposed to something which could be approved fairly readily without uh, without having to look what's gonna happen two or three years down the road. All right, let's pursue our four or five years down the road. With that in mind, let's get right oh, by the way too, you just just for fun, here it is. Let's check this out. Whoops, I get the right area. Because we're talking a lot about common cold viruses. This is to give you an idea of, of how, how science and investigation works. Now, for example, many of you already know, and this is an important aspect, if a vaccine is not fully effective, the vaccine itself doesn't have to spread the virus. But if you take a vaccine, for example, and um, then a person catches that virus, but the vaccine is not fully effective, you can get what's called wild excretors. Wild excre excretors is a very strong commonality in other parts of the world in reference to polio, especially when dealing with the oral, oral polio vaccination. But that's a virus. But again, even then, you could have mutations as we discussed last week. Now check this out. God. Common cold virus can cause polio in mice when injected into muscles. Now, many of you that have been following you know, I, uh, or in various venues. No, I've been doing this for a long time. This was September 2004. And this is to give you food for thought. It says, one injected, basically. The researcher injected a cold virus called Coxsackievirus A21 into mice that were engineered to be susceptible to the particular virus. However, instead of developing a cold, the mice unexpectedly display paralytic symptoms characteristic of polio. The researchers determined that administering the virus directly into muscles instead of the virus' normal home, remember, like, for example, almost, I would almost prefer if many of you understand vaccine history, variolation as opposed to vaccination. Variolation is when you put some cuts, like three cuts in your arm and then expose it to the virus because it was, it was traveling the normal pathways. But, you know, a needle is a lot cleaner than someone slicing your arm. So instead of the virus is normal home in the nasal cavity was critical development for a polio. See, so we reiterate it. The researchers determined that the administering the virus directly into muscles instead of the virus's normal home in the nasal cavity, so it's going through a different pathway that normally the body is accustomed to, was critical for the development of polio, Coxsackie virus A21, common cold. Quote, in principle, Coxsackie viruses could cause polio in humans. Quote, we are in the process of eradicating polio worldwide. 
But if we eliminate the polio virus and cease polio vaccinations, this is how you, you get yourself in a corner. Our immune systems wouldn't produce antibodies against polio. Are you reading that clearly? And Coxaxi virus could theoretically fill the niche of eradicated or niche of eradicated polio. I'll reiterate one more time because this is important not to deride the use of a certain medical treatment, i.e. inoculation, but to give you an idea of the outcomes that could be associated way down the road that were not anticipated. This is why I usually prefer a medication, for example, as a pill or a tablet or whatever, a nasal spray, as opposed to something which uh, has may have a desired outcome, but has a lot of unknowns attached to that outcome. In principle, Coxaxi virus could cause polio in humans. We are in the process of eradicating polio worldwide, but if we eliminate the polio virus and cease polio vaccinations, our immune systems wouldn't produce antibodies against polio. And Coxaxi virus could theoretically fill the niche of eradicated polio. Quote, end quote. All right, with that in mind, let's get right into the research as follows. Here we go. I'm going to go to the top. That was myocarditis. And we are going to go. This is data frames. The data frames we are pulling from the VAERS system for the fact checkers, which is important for them to know too because we need to validate our data. If more data was validated on YouTube and places like that, it make their job a lot easier as well. Vaccine reaction reports by vaccine, January to June 18, 2021. All right, and again, this is not fair knowing the, the ratios of each vaccine, but this is numbers right off the bat. So here we are, the Moderna, the Pfizer, the Janssen, and ones that are not listed. There's the Zoster shingles, there's the influenza, a couple of them, and that's all the vaccines pretty much being administered that the VAERS uh, reporting system keeps track of. Going down the line. All right, one second. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Concatenation. COVID. COVID. Did I do this last week? I said COVID too. Because I'm calling COVID and vaccine. Because I'm speaking too fast. Becomes COVID. All right. COVID vaccine reaction reports by age. Here we are. Again. Looking almost like at a bell curve there. Uh, it's just, you know, representation of the population. And we're watching some rises here as opposed to less rises there. All right, this is the ages, 10 to 15, 50 to 20, so on and so forth. An unfortunate aspect of COVID, did it again, COVID vaccine death reports by age. We are at 4,652 vaccine adverse event reaction reports. Again, I want to reiterate, it has to be confirmed. 4,652 is the amount of reports that have come in where they have basically had made a correlation, not a causative relationship, between the vaccine and mortality. So keep in mind, I read a lot of these reports too. They're pretty detailed and they're really quite sad, but again, still just the same. There has to be, don't want emotional bias to be involved. But as we stand at 4,652, people saying the vaccine is perfectly safe, uh, that needs to be fact-checked. Seriously, but to proceed. All right, COVID vaccine reaction reports by day of the week. That's just me looking for certain things. Uh, the rolling seven days. There we are. All right, we're looking at right here, the CDC information, the myocarditis, which we looked at already. And then we're going down. We looked at this already. Boom, we led with that. Uh, do, 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 do. Well, right, here we are. What I did is I decided to pull under the age of 22. And to see exactly what happened. And these are individuals, unfortunately, which uh, had succumbed. Uh, these are all important for investigation. Uh, the, it's, they're pretty detailed. And the, the date, the date they died. And then also, too, as far as we go down the list here, these are all the mortalities. You notice a lot of either suicide or cardiac arrest. So, again... I don't know if there is a pattern involved, uh, but you know, you can cardiac arrest at 15, 15. And so it's 
15 again. I don't know what the CDC leadership is doing. I know a lot of CDC staffers have been around for a long time, have really been doing a great job maintaining this database. Uh, but again, the leadership of the CDC, um, they, they got a lot of gall. That's all I got to say. And uh, you know, to proceed, especially with the, um, uh, the low likelihood of severity of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in youth, um, this age here, I'll have to investigate uh, later on. Sometimes through uh, breastfeeding and lactation, uh, it appears potentially that there could be some issues. Um, again, I doubt that that's that one. So that's probably meant to be 18. They got a zero put in there. There's a lot of data, uh, dirty data, so to say. Um, yeah, so these are the mortalities related to basically in the younger individuals. Uh, you, you can see it. It's like, it's like they, they really got to investigate um, potentially the, uh, the mood altering effect of the vaccine. Vaccines are renowned for impacting uh, emotional well-being. Like the influenza vaccine was discovered a few years ago that actually made people more social. Uh, the rubella vaccine many years ago, 1998, was shown to increase likelihood of uh, behavioral problems and depression. And um, per se, at least observational-wise, so I'm not going to make that as a, a fact check thing. Uh, but yeah, the mood can be affected because of because of what they did is the inflammatory compounds. And yeah, as you go down throughout here, it's interesting. All right, to proceed forward. Da, da, da. Let's go. This is the word, uh, or basically a word cloud. This is an easy way, not a scientific way, of looking at the primary reports, the words which are most common in a lot of these symptom reports is across all age groups. Let me make this a little smaller. So it fits all in there. Where we just went. There it is. All right. To look at the bar chart. There we are, the top 30 reported symptoms across the board. As you want to read down there, again, you can see like headache and fatigue are your most often. Uh, and then, you know, injection site pain, rash, swelling are also some of the most common. Uh, but you can get an idea of what may be popping up. Now, this is, a, this is the immediate stuff. We don't know if there's any long-term stuff. All right, let's keep them moving forward. COVID, COVID. Vaccine reaction reports by age. This is under the age of eight. This is 19 or younger. So there it is. That's the most uh, common age group where it's going to have a vaccine adverse reaction report. Um, days of the week. Database stuff, database stuff. Again, I didn't move this around. This is the lot numbers that have the greatest number of vaccine adverse reaction reports associated with them. Again, this is just numerical. So it says 175. It's 175. You know, let's keep on going. Let's make this a little bit again. Now I got really small again. All right, let's go back up here. This is dang it, still small. All right, here it is. This is basically um, individuals under the age of 19. The most common reports that they're making. This is only the last 15. All right, per se. So it's a pretty extensive. But uh, just, just basically utilizing this to test the database. But if you notice one thing too, which is a real interesting, again, you notice the dates here? And we did this last week as well. What do you see that's common there? Again, I don't know whether it's just the way the data is organized in reference to the vaccine adverse reaction report. If uh, any CDC members are watching this, please um, elucidate us in reference to why it seems this commonality. Now, obviously, we know before last time, uh, this is the most common reason for the report. They may not have a symptom, uh, but however, though, a lot of people are being administered the vaccine, which are at, they're too young. And that's really common. So that's why the Janssen pops up. So it's not really fair to Janssen, but however, though, um, because some people are falsifying their age or the administrators are not asking the age. To proceed forward, 
This is the word cloud in children. Make it small again. All right, this is the most common reactions in a word cloud. Look at this. You see that right there? That is one of the most common two words in reference to the vaccine reaction in younger individuals. The vaccine adverse event reaction reports are far different than those in the adults. So that's unusual. Uh, you know, everything that you see here, you're seeing basically, you know, uh, in reference to the chest, heart rate, and so on and so forth is the primary reason. So let's look at the chart here. Most common, of course, is headache. And then basically you start seeing everything else. Uh, that starts, you know, coming into play. Chest pain. Think about that. This is literally the top five in the reports currently. Top five. Now, can they be mentioned in the media quite often, play a role in that? Uh, we'll have to find out. But I would not expect to see this. When someone's getting a shot in the arm, to have chest pain be one of the top adverse event reaction reports that are being reported. All right, to proceed forward. Uh, now we're going really small here again. Do, 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 do. All right, back down. There we go. Just follow along. What's what I did down here? If I did anything, our vaccine adverse event reports, um, basically by vaccine. Now people are now. This is interesting. Check this out. Ready for this? Now remember, there's a little bit of a lag time. Look at the number of vaccines that are being administered. Now, look at the reports. You would expect normally, if the vaccines being administered, again, not counting a date, a date lag, are less, that the reports would go down. That may play into our hypothesis that we came up to a little while ago that people are, that are reluctant to get vaccines per se, if they're being forced to by their employers and so on and so forth, or more likely to report injury due to vaccine. And I'll think about it. If the vaccine company, whether it be Pfizer, Moderna, whoever, is protected against lawsuits and litigation, but the employer mandates the vaccine, is the employer protected? I don't know. I'm not an attorney. But to proceed forward, but think about that. That's interesting food for thought. All right, to proceed forward. Uh, average age reverse reaction reports. Just going down the line right there. And then what is this I came up with? The six-week thing. Scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. All right, here's a new one. All right, this is, this is something different. Now let's make this small again. All right, what we did here, you and I, is we based, whoop, where'd it go? All right, this is the number of days, get me out of the way, the number of days before the vaccination and the adverse event report. So right now, a lot of those adverse reaction reports, according to the database is super sloppy too. So, so there's often, for example, uh, Onset dates and things like that are really messed up. We just do a lot, a lot of uh, uh, cleaning up. But however, though, and um, yeah, if I could show you some of the, the, the dates which are off, you'd be blown away. But after you clean up the database the best we can, most reports are within zero days, pretty fast. So basically, people are reacting right away. They're filling out a report. But now we're getting reports. Now this is a minimum of um, what I do it at. A minimum of 100 reports. So you have about 61, a lot of reactions now are going as far back as 61 days. And remember, this is not numerical sequence because it just happens to be when 100 reports or more, uh, how many days out using, uh, uh, you know, date time uh, math, math, so to say. So you're not going to have like 53, 54, 55 because it could have been less than 100 reports filed in those days out. So we're going as far out as 61 days now. You're going to have 100 plus reports. and But a majority of reports are pretty fast. So the majority, it happens really fast. Uh, 
Now here, for example, seven days, three days, see it's going not in a date sequence. So it's going by number of reports sequence, five days, six days. So you have seven days, more reports filled, filled out seven days as opposed to reports being filled out in four days. So about a one week after, you'll get more reports than, than four days after. You see what I mean? So now you're going to, again, as far out as 61 days. And I think that ends the vaccine thing. All right, next. We are going to go to variants. Here we go. You ready? Ba -ba -ba. All right, what I did here is since is I don't want to be caught off guard in reference to the variants per se. And obviously, you know, we have to respect our position in the pond that we're not going to change much of anything from just the small YouTube channel. But it doesn't mean we can't watch. So here we go. This, what I did is I took the United States, India, and Britain. Since those are the, pretty much the two, the three areas we're concerned about variants. So here we go. So we're going to Outbreak Data Info. Again, wonderful, wonderful site. And this is the United States. Now keep in mind, you're always going to have 100%. So even though you can have very few people infected, you know, B1617 2 can be 10%, B117 can be 90%, even though you have five cases. So the percentage, for example, you're going to hear a lot. People are going to say, well, B117 is nearly 80% of all the cases out there, but yet there could only be 10 cases. You see what I mean? It's going to skew, it's going to sensationalize the media. But to check the variants, just the same. This is new vaccination smooth. And there we are there. And there's B1617, and you see B117, how they basically begin to intertwine. So this one's coming out a little further. Now, this is going to play a huge role in whether the vaccines can offer adequate potential protection. That's why that one research article referenced to the other protein pockets uh, behind the metal ion, remember we just read a little while ago, uh, is going to be important because they look for a commonality among all coronaviruses as opposed to just picking out this particular spike protein. That's the United States. This is India. There's B16172 and there's B117. See B117 is all the way down there. And there's things about like viral pathogen replacement and so on and so forth. There's B6112 and there's B117 in the United States. And then India, it's like, pff, it's not even their hiding boot. It's primarily this one. And then let's go to England. There's B117 and there's B1612. Rise B1617 rising pretty fast. But that doesn't mean there's more cases. It just means that's more, that the ratio of the variant in those infected is to be higher, that particular variant itself. And it also can give you a really good indicator whether you have vaccine success or failure. This is what I look for. These are heat maps. You see a 0.7 or more. There's a correlation between them, uh, per se. Vaccination to variant, uh, same type of thing. Looking, for example, for what I'm looking for is this. Now, be honest. I'm looking for basically vaccine derived viruses. You know, whether it's caused from the mutation of individuals being inoculated that may have a virus per se, you're not gonna you're not gonna catch it from an mRNA vaccine. All right. But doesn't mean it can't cause mutations like the plasma did last life last week was shown and cause other issues. All right, just be honest. Here we are, B one seven, this is the United States, these are basically our variants. Uh this is a data anomaly. Let's see how that looks next week. And then just stuff. Da, 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 da. But now, here's where it gets interesting. Right? Let's look at let's look first look at the Monte Carlo method. What are we looking for? Do, do, do. There is the uh, new deaths current in the United States. See how it's going down. Monte Carlo has been pretty much on cue regardless of basically the variants which have been exposed. And basically, this is what the Monte Carlo prediction is showing right now. New cases per million prediction Monte Carlo. So right now we are right here. This is all closed. This is June 20th. And if we follow this Monte Carlo, and this is cases per million, right there, you know, about 35. Follow the Monte Carlo. It should, if provided nothing weird comes up, again, only dealing with what we have in the environment right now, you're looking basically at pretty low by the time of December 6, 2021. All right, and so death per million prediction Monte Carlo. Uh, right now, the United States is pretty low at about 0.9. So 
so we keep on going. That's from uh, 2021, June 20th. And um, if you go down to about 0.1, that's be pretty similar to influenza. So that now would be by December 6, 2021. Now keep in mind, this is our 36th week, 36th week doing this. So you, we always can check the accuracy just by going back a few weeks or so and checking out the Monte Carlo. All right, here we go. Over world data. Ba -ba -ba. Eventually, there we are. All right, going down here, down here. I want to show you some interesting information. This is mortality percentage of positive cases, but something even more interesting. And let's go down, 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 down. Now, with all the information we covered a long time ago, not interesting anymore. No, 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 no. Remember, we don't talk about Sweden anymore. All of Asia. Uh, da, da, da. Don't care about that anymore. Uh, the world. People fully vaccinated. Death smooth per million. That's the that's the number of people uh, fully vaccinated across the globe. Uh, this is how, you know, it appears so superfluous, the number of people compared to the number of people being vaccinated. And therefore, it's gone down, and the new death smooth per million is right about there. It's actually dropping. And here we go. This is, you know, new cases smooth per million. And, of course, it's switched colors here. Blue is fully vaccinated. Let's go. Da, 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 da. Let's go past that. Please forgive me. I'm going kind of fast now. Check this out. Ready? Check this out. Here we go. And this is, I don't know what to make of this. Again, it, this could. This is the stuff of uh, correlation is not causative. All right. Let's back this down just a little bit. All right. Let's go here. So I'm not going to say anything. But here we are. Purple equals fully vaccinated. Red is the people succumbing. Remember, there could be less people because this is percentage of people infected, which could be lower, and, and basically people succumbing that have been affected. The mortality percentage of those that have been affected. Now, that caught my eye. That is why I started looking at this data more because this doesn't necessarily mean anything but it means to look start looking all right just to keep an eye out or to form an, a null hypothesis an alternative hypothesis to show if you can do the data and show there's absolutely no relationship between mortality percentage or people fully vaccinated or be, be a confounding factor involved. Again, as less people are becoming infected, they may be more um, fragile immune system wise. And therefore you're gonna have a higher percentage of those people still succumbing because the people that are now getting it tend to be less well off. All right, you see what I mean? So even though the vaccine, for example, could be working, the healthier people are not getting it anymore, the, the people are still getting out of the people which are really sick and so on and so forth, therefore more likely to succumb. Uh, so again, just something to keep an eye out on. All right, correlations, correlations, quantiles, da, 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 da. Let's check out Asia. Now, let's right here. Look at, remember how India and everything else is like, boom, 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 boom. Down we go. And there it is. It like hit that peak and boom, down it went. Now, here's the catch. Africa. It seems like every continent is going these, these type of cycles. Africa's rising, Asia rose, and look how fast it declined. All right, and then, of course, Europe is like a little ebb and a flow, like an algorithm. North America, do, 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 do. Uh, getting pretty low. And then going down the line, da, 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 This is probably a better way of looking at it right there. And then towards the bottom, now this is this visually this is this is confounding because the graph is a little close, and uh, but what I did is I broke it down to Europe and the United States. So let's look at those numbers there. Europe new cases per million. See how that's declined, and this is in January. USA new cases per million, and the pretty close. I think we're a little higher because you have looked at this y-axis here. Europe mortality per million, pretty low. USA mortality per million, 
Yeah, probably about the same if you compare the y-axis. Europe, cases to mortality. And there's a mortality down below. The United States, cases to mortality. So things are looking pretty good, provided there's no other uncertainty. But you're always going to have uncertainty. And so if things, are, if things don't change dramatically, it looks pretty good for everybody. All right, then let's go down to this one. They have it on India. Mm -hmm. Remember Sweden? We don't even talk about Sweden anymore, do we? Uh, the Brazil, thank goodness they're going down. They've, they've been hammered continuously. I don't know why. Japan, the Olympic Games, yeah, they're probably going to be fine. Uh, New Zealand, yeah, that's New Zealand. Uh, Finland, yeah. A lot of countries came out unscathed. The epidemiologists have a gold mine of information. India, all right, they have uh, they've look like they're doing better. And cases have gone down. And so it looks pretty good. And so on and so forth. So that's actually pretty good overall as far as what's being uh, seen. And then we're going to go to... Do, 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 do. Let's go this way. Hospitals. Pff, that's what that, that makes a difference to you. Nothing dramatic. All right. COVID rebuild, vaccine. Let's... let's Let's. I don't think there's anything else. This is the states right now. It's. It's not going to tell us anything new. So I don't want to go through this database and and basically consume your time. But otherwise, just the same. Let's end it there, and we'll review VARES again uh, next week. Uh, again, they've been doing a great job as far as releasing the information every seven days, uh, except for that one time when it was down. And I'll keep track of the variants. And uh, if there's anything new to report, I'll report it next week. But let's look at what we reviewed real fast. Do, 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 do. Yes, this is in 2004. Common cold virus can cause polio in mice. If you want, to next week, uh, I will go through how we, not we, we as a, we as a humans as a whole, as a species, invented a virus almost it was actually a birth control method for rodents that was accidentally discovered that had a hundred percent lethality and was not stoppable talk about gain of function all right but i'll maybe i'll go through the next week but otherwise let's see we look at our databases where is our world in data uh incredible incredible database beautiful beautiful that they've done a great job this the entire event VAERS, the CDC, again, they're accumulating data left and right. Uh, Got to give them credit for that. I just hope they have the people to investigate massive amount of new cases, uh, or I should say event, adverse event reports, because that's, that's overwhelming. Uh, someone's got to ask the question, are you guys actually investigating these or not? I mean, and then we had wonderful new site being, getting into, outbreak.info. Uh, wonderful for following the variants. Great, great site for data. Again, common cold. Uh, the I really would like to see the this emergency use authorization revisited. Just my personal humble opinion. Reinfection rates less than one percent. Myocard uh, myocarditis. Myocarditis. I'm having a hard time with that tonight. Myocarditis. Uh, yeah, there's something more to it. And the CDC was actually meeting on Friday, June 18th, and it's June 20th. Review the evidence. And if there is a actual, you know, uh, causal association, what was the outcome of that meeting? All right, uh, symptoms, we went through that. Uh, yeah, great seven-year cycles, wonderful. Hopefully, uh, we, better, uh, we do a better job, uh, regardless, so we learn a lot. Keep in mind, no one's going to get away with anything. All the data accumulated during this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a gold mine for students, colleges, universities, and so on and so forth. I mean, when you're a data student, all you're really looking at is the sepal length of freaking flowers, uh, some Darwin-type birds, and you know what I'm talking about, and, and who stayed in what cabin during the Titanic. That's all data scientists train on, pretty much a sepal length, Titanic, and birds. But 
the information that came out in reference to data analytics, this this cycle, so much has been collected. Data analysts are going to go through this for decades to come. And if people did their job with noble intent, that will be reinforced. If there was some other intent involved, that will be brought out as well. Procedures 2, common cold combats COVID-19. Really, really cool. Dire warning towards the bottom, though. But regardless of that, really, really cool information from Yale University. Again, respect and gratitude to all of the researchers. Uh, just the same. And as always, thank you. Gratitude. And I look forward to seeing you all once again next week at our normal time on you know, past midnight on usually Sunday morning or Sunday morning. But just the same humble gratitude. Thank you. And look forward to hearing or hoping you hear me or basically you watch. And I'll see you all once again next week. We're all signing off. Catch you all next time. Bye.